Hello, everyone. Nice to see you all. Welcome to session 10 of our course about the foremost theories of old. Today, we are talking about the legend of the Seven Sisters. So I hope you all brought a cup of tea because uh, today will be storytelling time, fairy tale time. Um, so today we're not looking at any specific foremost theory. We are not comparing any early texts. We are only looking at the later legend and the fairy tale. So to begin with, as usual, we will chant the Namotasa and then we can get started. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Bodang Damang Sangang Namasami So I will share my screen as usual and then we can start. So as mentioned today, we are talking about the legend of the Seven Sisters. And this is a story that is very popular in most, if not all, of the early Buddhist schools. So we have lots and lots of texts about uh, this particular legend. I think definitely more than 10 texts um, in all the various languages, Pali and Sanskrit and Chinese and Tibetan and so on. And um, this legend forms a part, the most famous part, but only one part of a whole fan fiction universe that is built around uh, King Kiki of Kasi, who was king uh, at Kasapa Buddha's time. So Kasapa Buddha was the Buddha just before our Buddha, Buddha Gautama. Um, and obviously that was a very popular time that inspired a lot of cre creativity in the later Buddhist tradition. So it was an extremely popular time. Uh, to tell stories about. And so we have plenty of prequels and sequels and spin-offs. So we have previous lives, prequels, previous lives of the Seven Sisters. We have sequels, we have uh, future lives of the Seven Sisters. And then also spin-offs, that means like stories about King Kiki's son, stories about King Kiki's general, stories about like all the various other um, personalities that inhabit this uh, universe. Uh, and that are around King Kiki. And all these are later stories. So in the early sources, we don't really find anything about them. Uh, the only thing is that King Kiki himself is mentioned two times in the early Pali suttas. Um, so one time he's mentioned in the Mahapadana Sutta, the Genikaya 14. And there, um, there is a passage about Kasapa Buddha and King Kiki's name is just mentioned there as being the king in Kasapa Buddha's time. And the other early sutta is the Gatikara Sutta, Majjhima Nikaya 81. And this is a very beautiful, very lovely sutta. Um, very touching, very heartwarming. And there King Kiki plays a little bit uh, of a bigger role. Uh, and uh, the whole sutta is set in Kasapa Buddha's time. And I think this is probably the basis um, for that sparked the creativity and that um, uh, on which like later, later tradition then built this entire fan fiction universe. Um, because the sutta is so lovely, so touching. So people were thinking about what's happening to those characters and they were populating uh, those stories with more and more characters. Uh, and so finally the legend of the seven sisters also was uh, put into this time. Um, and yeah, as I just said, it, it was popular in almost all Buddhist traditions. Um, but the problem is that we don't really have good, we don't really have any English translations from other schools except for the Pali texts. And the Pali texts are the shortest. And um, 
yeah, they don't really preserve the story of the Seven Sisters in any detail. So, but, but because we have them in English, I'm thinking we should start with them and then slowly build up the story from there. So in the Pali tradition, uh, we have two texts that deal with the Seven Sisters. One is the Apadana literature. So uh, as we know, the Seven Sisters uh, in uh, King Kiki's time, uh, then later identified with the foremost theories in Gautama Buddha's time. So the famous theories like Kema and Upalavana and so on, uh, all form part of this group of the Seven Sisters. So a previous life of, the, of those nuns was the Seven Sisters. And so in their Apadana literature, we, uh, we find the stories of the Seven Sisters. And here we see the Apadanas 18 to 23. So all these nuns um, have the story and it's a stock passage. So it's the same in every single Apadana. And here I have included the story of um, Kema, but it would be the same for, for any of the other nuns too. So um, the story goes as follows. In this present lucky Ian, Brahma's kinsman, greatly famed one, the Buddha known as Kastapa was born the best of debaters. The attendant of that, sage, of that great sage was the ruler of men back then, the king of Kasi named Kiki in Benares' greatest city. I was that king's eldest daughter, well known by the name Samani. Hearing the best victor's teaching, I chose to seek ordination. Our father did not permit it. We stayed at home during that time, comfortable royal maidens, doing our practice with vigor, in virginal celibacy for 20 times a thousand years, fond of waiting on the Buddha, the king's seven joyful daughters, Samani and Samanagutta, Bhikkhuni and Bhikkhadaika, Dhamma and also Sudhamma and seventh Sangadaika. So this is basically the entirety of the story of the Seven Sisters here in the Apadana. So we see there isn't really any story at all. The only information we get is that there are seven sisters and that they, that they um, wanted to ordain under um, Kasapa Buddha, but the father did not permit it and they stayed at home as lay women. And then we have the name of the seven sisters here. Yeah. So this is actually unique to the Pali tradition. Of course, in all other traditions, they do become ascetics and that's actually the main part of the story. So the actual story is missing in the Pali tradition and we only find it in non-Pali sources. And um, we see how they are doing ascetic practices in those non-Pali sources. And um, that's again, interesting that that is missing from the Pali because we have already seen um, in our session about the ascetic nuns how um, uh, ascetic practices became quite controversial for women in later times, but th that the non-Pali traditions were much more open and preserved those much longer lists about ascetic nuns and uh, seemed to be much more open uh, towards women undertaking ascetic practices. So again, that this story is missing from the Pali is uh, very interesting and sort of confirms the finding we had before already. And, um, then the seven, um, seven sisters are now identified with the seven um, persons in Gautama Buddha's time. So it's I, I means Kema and Upalavanna, Patachara and Kundala. Kundala is Bada Kundala Kesa, who we talked about last time. Kisa Gotami, who we talked about briefly uh, in our session about the ascetic nuns. And then Dhammadina. Dhammadina we haven't talked about in our course. So we don't have a session about her, but she's also one of the foremost nuns. She is um, foremost in teaching Dhamma. And um, she has a very beautiful sutta, Majjhima Nikaya 44, the Chula Vidala Sutta. So uh, if you want, you can go and check that out yourself. And then the seventh is Visaka. Visaka obviously is not a nun. She's a laywoman, uh, foremost for giving, uh, for supporting the Sangha. So Visara, Visaka, Visaka Migara Mata, uh, pretty famous, uh, probably uh, you've heard about her. And so this is the entirety of the story in the Apadana, Pali Apadana. And as I mentioned, um, there is a second version in the Pali, this time in the Jataka, uh, in a Jataka called the Vesantara Jataka. And um, 
There, the story is even shorter and it's embedded in a much longer story about two sisters. Uh, and the story starts at Vipassi Buddha's time, so a, a long time before Kasapa Buddha, 91 years ago. And their two sisters give gifts to Kasapa Buddha and make an aspiration. And one of the sisters aspires to become the mother of a Buddha and then later becomes Mahamaya, the Buddha Gotama's mother. And the other one aspires to becoming an Arahant. And so she is actually the eldest daughter of King Kiki. And she, her name is Urachada and she goes forth and does become an Arahant. And at that point, um, the story of the seven sisters picks up when she um, becomes an Arahant and uh, becomes a Bhikkhuni and then enters Nirvana. And then the Jataka story tells us that King Kiki had seven other daughters. Um, and those names were Samani, Samana, the Holy Sister Kutta, Bhikkhudasika, and Dhamma, and Sudhamma. And uh, of the sisters, the seventh Sangadasi. So the names are fairly similar to the Apadana, but not exactly the same, even though both of these texts are from the Pali tradition. And now they are identified with uh, nuns or with women in Gotama, Buddha's time. And there it said, these are Kema, Upalavana, the third was Patachara, then Gotama, um, Dhammadina, and sixthly, Mahamaya. Mahamaya we haven't seen in the other list with the, uh, of the Apadana. And of this band of sisters, the seventh was Visaka. So it's not exactly the same and the same um, identifications as we have seen just now. So um, it is quite interesting that not all the texts, as I mentioned, we have a lot of texts that tell the story of the seven sisters, but not all the texts identify the sisters with nuns or with women in Gautama Buddha's time. Only three texts do that. And uh, even in these three texts, there is some overlap, but they're not exactly the same. So I've made a little table here with the three texts that, that we have that identify the seven sisters with, um, with women in Gautama Buddha's time. The first one, as we have just seen, is the Pali Apadana. The second one is the Vesantara Jataka we've also just read. And the third one is a text called the Nukutaravara Bhikkhuni Vinaya. This is a Sanskrit text. And we have already mentioned this in our session about the Bhikkhuni Vinaya. And I've, I've mentioned that this is an extremely important text for Bhikkhuni Vinaya studies, but it does also contain Apadanas. Uh, and so this story of the seven sisters is also found there. And um, we see that two Pali lists are fairly similar. So both of them have Kema first, then Upalavana, then Patachara. Um, then one text has here Kisa Gotami and the other one has Gotama. This might be the same person. Otherwise, we don't really know who Gotama might refer to. There is no nun really called Gotama. There is also Mahapajapati Gotami, but probably she would have been identified as Mahapajapati if, if, if this was referring to her. And then, of course, Damadina is the same. And we see that Bada Kundala Kesa has been replaced with Mahamaya, so the Buddha's mother. And of course, the Buddha's mother is not a bhikkhuni at all. She's a lay person. She passed away seven days after the Buddha was born. And then, of course, Visaka, we know, is also not um, a bhikkhuni. And in the Lukutaravada Bhikkhuni Vinaya, um, there are some similar names and some very different names. So the first nun here is Sukha, in Sanskrit called Sukla. And um, she is known in the Pali tradition. She has two short suttas in the Samyutta Nikaya and a poem in the Tirigata. But, and she also has an Apadana text, but um, she's not very popular. Um, there's not, mu not much attention paid to her in the Pali tradition. But in non-Pali traditions, she seems to have been a lot more popular. She's included in the list of foremost nuns for her Dhamma teaching qualities um, or for her great compassion. And um, she also has quite a number of um, apadanas, different apadanas. Um, so there's a lot more information about her and she seems to have been a lot more popular in the non-Pali tradition. 
And then the next one is Upalavanna, of course, the same, Patachara also the same, and Kisa Gotami also the same. And then here we find Mahapajapati Gotami. This is interesting. Um, she's not found anywhere in the Pali tradition. One name is missing. Um, and then, of course, uh, Visaka, the laywoman, is again the same. So we see there's quite some variants um, in those names. And this points us also to the fact that they probably weren't um, an original part of the story. And um, the original part is actually just uh, um, the seven sisters in King, Kiki time, King Kiki's time, Kasapa Buddha's time itself, and all those prequels with the previous lives and the sequels with the um, life in Gotama Buddha's time uh, are probably um, have um, developed over time at, at a time after the legend of the seven sisters was created. So um, now I'd like to have a look a little bit at this whole narrative cycle of the seven sisters. Uh, and I've made this table and I'll explain this table in a minute. Um, but this is this table is based on a scientific study called the Legende von den Sieben Prinzessinnen, the legend of the seven princesses. Uh, this is a really, really wonderful study for people who can read German. Um, it's like an amazing overview. There are translations of almost all of these texts into German uh, together with the original language. And uh, so um, for people who want to look deeper, this is really, really wonderful. It's also freely available on the internet. Uh, you just have to dig around a little bit. It's not that easy to find, but it is freely available. Um, and what we see here is, as I mentioned, we have more than 10 different texts and those texts are the main texts I have listed here. And here uh, we have uh, the different um, lives. So here we have King, the, the life of the seven sisters, King Kiki's daughters, and how they become ascetics. And then the prequels to that, uh, their life as Nagas, which are water dragons, mythological um, beings, and as clams, and as fishermen's daughters. And then um, the sequel uh, as the Bhikkhunis and the Buddha Gautama. Uh, we see that none of the texts actually preserve all the stories. Um, so like if, if the text has, um, preserves the story, I've made, uh, I've made the, the rectang rectangle blue. And if it doesn't have the story, I've left it blank. So we see none of the text has the complete narrative cycle. Some of them have the prequel, some of them have the sequel, some of them only have the story of the seven sisters. Um, so we have two texts that preserve the prequels the Ashoka Avadana and the Shambhuka Apadana or Avadana. These are both uh, texts in Sanskrit. And then we have uh, the Lokuttaravada Vinaya, which we have just seen, and the Pali Jataka and the Pali Apadana texts, which have, uh, which mention or have the story or mention King Kiki's daughters and identify them as Bhikkhunis and the Buddha Gautama. And we know the Pali text leaves out the whole part of them becoming ascetics. And then we have a lot of other texts that only have the story of the Seven Sisters uh, without any prequels or sequels. So um, these other texts here are um, the so-called Turfan fragments. These, this is a fragmentary text, not a complete text, from an expedition called the Turfan Expedition. This is also in Sanskrit. There is another Apadana text edited or redacted by someone called Gopadatta. And this is the basis for the Tibetan translation. Uh, but the Tibetan translation is much enlarged uh, as compared to the Gopadatta version. And then in Chinese, we have two texts. One is the parallel to the Lukutaravada Vinaya, so a Vinaya text. And I haven't included it in this table because it's quite similar to the Lokutaravada Vinaya text, and then a Sutta text called T556. And this text is very interesting because it tells the story of the Seven Sisters, but it uh, differs quite significantly from uh, other versions. So what we are going to do in a minute is we are going to read this Lokutaravada Vinaya version, 
because that is considered to be the oldest complete version. And um, <coughs> sorry. And where, where it differs, uh, where the Chinese text differs and where the Tibetan text differs, I will point out all the differences. And then finally, we also, uh, we also see that this uh, story was popular not only in Buddhist texts, it was also popular in, in Hindu texts. So there is a Hindu text called the Katha Sarit Sagara. And in that text, the, the story of the Seven Sisters is also included, obviously not with a Buddhist connotation, but the whole idea of, the, of King Kiki having seven daughters and them going forth and becoming ascetics and so on is mentioned in this um, Hindu text. So clearly um, they, they, the story was popular even outside Buddhist circles. So um, before we move on, to reading the Lokutara Vadavinya version. I will just briefly tell you the stories here of the previous lives of King Kiki's seven daughters, which we find uh, in the Ashoka Avadana and the Shambhuka Avadana. So the story starts um, with the seven uh, princesses, the seven daughters being seven Nagas. And as I mentioned, Nagas are uh, mythological creatures um, like water dragons or water snakes. And those seven Nagas were living in a pond and there was a group of Rishis. So Rishis are um, ancient sages or spiritual uh, figures. And those Rishis wanted to do a ceremony at that pond. And because the Nagas were very religious, they wanted to attend the ceremony. So they went there, but because Nagas have poisonous breath, all the rishis fainted and the ceremony was interrupted and they couldn't complete the ceremony. So the uh, rishis uh, were quite upset and they cursed the Nagas. And even though the Nagas were very sorry and they repented, they couldn't remove the curse anymore. So they were reborn as clams or shells at the bottom of that pond. And according to the Shambhuka Avadana version, they were still very religious as clams and there was a Buddhist stupa in that pond. And so they spent, the day spent their days circumambulating that stupa as clams. And so eventually they were captured by a fisherman and the, wife, uh, the fisherman's wife cooked them and ate them. And in due course, she uh, was pregnant and she gave birth to seven daughters. Um, and those uh, seven daughters remembered their past lives and they were still very religious. And they wanted to make good karma. So they were quite appalled at having to be fishermen's daughters because that means they have to kill fish. Um, and so the parents gave them the job to uh, take all the, the fish to the market and to kill the fish there and then sell them. But the daughters actually released all the fish and they collected dead fish and tried to sell the dead fish at the market, which didn't work. So the parents got very angry, but still every day they did the same. And so there was a lot of conflict and their life was very difficult. And there was apparently a Buddhist temple at that pond and the daughters were venerating that um, temple. And so, uh, finally, they had a vision. The Buddha appeared to them in a vision and promised them to um, release them from this difficult situation, this very conflictive situation. So on the one hand, they want to obey their parents, but on the other hand, they also don't want to make the bad karma of killing. So after seven days, they died and they were reborn as King Kiki's daughters. Um, so this is according to the uh, Ashoka Avadana version, according to the Shambhuka Avadana version, they didn't have a vision of the Buddha himself, but there was a real life Pacheka Buddha who came to them and gave them a teaching, a Dhamma teaching. And then after seven days, they were reborn as King Kiki's daughters. So now um, with that much preparation, I think we are ready to read the Lokutara Vada Vinaya text, which picks up now here at this point, where they are King Kiki's daughters. And as I have mentioned, we don't have an English version of this text. 
So we are going to read from the German version and I'm going to translate as we go along. And um, let me find the German version. So uh, this story is quite long, seven pages long, but I think we should have enough time, hopefully, to go through. So the story begins. In the former time, when Kashapa was the Buddha in the city of Benares, there was, Hiki, uh, there was the king Hiki. And he had seven daughters called Shramana, Shamani Mitra, Bhikshuni, Bhikshuni Dasika, Dharma and Sudharma, and the seventh was Sangadasi. So we see the names are fairly similar to the Pali uh, version that we have just seen. Of course, the names are Sanskritized because this is a Sanskrit text, but otherwise they're pretty similar. And on the full moon day, the 15th and the 8th of every half month, they observed the holy days and they kept the eight precepts. And because of their virtue, they always observed the fast days and among the inhabitants of Benares, there was a lovely youth named Bajaka. He was skilled in dancing and singing, and he always pleased the crowd that had gathered uh, with performances of stringed instruments and dance. And when the seven princesses, the graceful ones, the beautiful ones, had heard that this youth had died, they came together, went to the king and told him the following. Um, our father, guardian of the empire of Benares, we ask you, please permit us, king, to contemplate the charnel ground, which is dedicated or um, consecrated to the god of death. So basically what happens is this beautiful youth dies, and obviously that has an impact on the princesses, and now they want to do death contemplation. So it stirs them up, they are quite emotionally involved, it seems, and now they're asking the king to let them do death contemplations on the charnel ground. And they continue saying, today is the 15th day of the month, uh, the, the day crowned with stars. Permit us, O king, to see the, um, the charnel ground dedicated to the Lord of Death. But the king isn't, uh, uh, isn't really convinced that that's a good idea. And he says, what do you want to do on the charnel ground? The terrible, the um, scary, foul-smelling, hair-raising, uh, where the people wail. Uh, on the scary charnel ground, where the discarded death lie around, without consciousness, eaten by others, without uh, spirit. On the terrible charnel grounds, were, charnel ground were, where vultures and jackals and crows and owls and wolves eat limb by limb. So now he's going through all the terrible aspects of a charnel ground and why that is totally unsuitable for the um, for the princesses. And he continues, "What you want to do on the charnel ground, where um, villains uh, walk around with their darts?" There's something missing here, obviously a, a more detailed description of those uh, villains. Um, and what you want to do on the charnel ground where you can see bones are scattered in all directions, the color of shells. What you want to do on the charnel ground, the terrible, where you can see a people impaled on stakes and impurities and the stench of slime and heaps of hair on the scary charnel ground infested by rogues and spies where robbers and wild animals abide and the residence of non-human beings. On the terrible charnel ground, the residence of non-human beings, the abode of demons, the residence of all hungry ghosts. On the terrible charnel ground where delicate girls wearing um, jewelry, gems, and bracelets, extend their arms and cry. On the, on the fear and terror-inducing charnel ground, 
where delicate girls wearing jewelry, gems and bracelets rent their hair and cry. On the um, terrible and scary charnel ground where mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, relatives and friends um, abide with uh, confused senses. On the terrible charnel ground where mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, relatives and friends um, stay with the no more answering dead person. So he's going into all the details about what is so terrible about the Chana ground and he continues on the terrible Chana ground where the relatives wail wordlessly, uh, stinking of pus or smelling of pus and terrible. What do you want to do on the Chana ground? Uh, the horrifying a field with the smoke of the funeral pyres where the palm leaves that are used to fan the flames are scattered in all directions. And this here is the beautiful palace, the most beautiful palace, the well-built pavilion where food and drink and entertainments are available. Enjoy this girls, what you want to do on the Charlie ground. So he is not having it and he is not giving permission for them to go. And he keeps on praising the palace and he says, at this lovely pond, which is beautified with chakra vakas. So uh, chakra vakas are a kind of duck, so a kind of bird. Uh, and the pond is uh, well covered with white lotus flowers and uh, filled with the smell of the nightly lotus flowers. Um, and it's filled with, uh, with heaps of different uh, kinds of birds and uh, different sounds and um, enjoy, enjoy yourself here, what you want to do on the Chana ground. So he's not giving permission. And the princesses say, Father, we also know that the Chana ground is terrible and horrifying and that they are, that they are uh, foul smelling corpses and that they are flowering Covidara flowers. So uh, I looked up Covidara flowers. So a Covidara is a kind of tree, uh, seems to be an ebony tree. And apparently that was a tree that was growing on Chana ground. Uh, and the princesses continue, but we have to leave the father and the father has to leave us. In no long time, everything changes and in no long time, we have to be without each other. So they're pointing out that death is inevitable and they have to be separated from each other at some point anyway. And apparently that convinces the king because now the king says, princesses, um, uh, recognizing suffering is something like again, the, uh, there's a, a gap in the manuscript. He's saying something about recognizing suffering. And then he tells them to enter the Chana ground at Muktaka with a mind that can no longer be tormented. So with a straight mind, a firm mind. So he's now finally giving permission. Um, and so when they had uh, received permission from King Kiki, they left the city of Benares and they all mounted a chariot and they drove and, and they who wanted to contemplate the Chana ground drove away. And on the way they saw a discarded and abandoned corpse, foul smelling and impure, inflated and uh, turned blue. So all seven princesses uh, descended from the chariot and they stood around the corpse and on all sides and they said this law applies to everyone this is a general law in the following we will speak seven stances about this um, this body so now each princess speaks one stanza about uh, the um, yeah about bodies or about um, the unreliable unreliability of bodies And the first one says, this one or this person whose body was formerly anointed with sandal paste 
who was wearing a white dress and lived as he pleased, who um, attached importance to beauty and to ancestry, is now being eaten in the middle of the charnel ground. And the second one says, this city of bones, or maybe the city of a skeleton, which is covered in flesh and blood, where uh, heaps of passions, hatred and delusion lived, having left this city, where did the master of the city go, or the lord of the city go? And the third one says, the one having given up this chariot with two wheels and two spokes, having left this chariot, where did the charioteer go? And the next one says, uh, the one having given up this banner with the twigs above and the root below, having left this banner, where did the banner carrier go? And the next one says, the merchant having given up the cartload and the precious horse, having given up this cartload, where did the merchant go? And the next one says, um, the one having given up this, um, this ship on the great ocean of eye delusion, having um, left this ship, where did the captain go? And the next one says, the wanderer uh, who wanted to reside in this house, having left this house, where did the wanderer go? So all of them are wondering where did the being pass on to after they have departed from this body that is now decaying. And they all rejoice in their stanzas and they all say our stanzas are well spoken, are well recited. And they praised each other on the charnel ground at Imutaka. So apparently they are enjoying their death contemplation. And now at this point, the God King Indra, the husband of Sachi, saw the um, inspired girl and he came to them and he said to them, you've all spoken well, you've all recited well. Girls, uh, tell me a wish, whatever would be pleasing to you. And they, the princesses say, who is standing there with heavenly colors in the air? Who are you and whose son are you and how can we know you? And he says, I am Indra, the thousand eyed, the Magavan, the elephant among the gods, are praised by the gods who are assembled in Sudharma, the hall of the gods. I am Indra with the thousand eyes, the god king, or the king of the gods, the husband of Sachi. Girls, tell me a wish, whatever would be pleasing to you. Indra is granting you a wish. The lord of the 33 gods, the powerful, tell me a wish, girls. Uh, tell it to me who is granting path. So um, now the princesses are telling him their wish. Uh, and it's, of course, uh, not what Indra expects. So the first princess says, uh, on whose root there is no bark, where there is no leaf and no creeper, uh, who is firm, freed of all ties, grant me that Indra as a wish. And the second one says, the monk wearing rag robes, who is um, emaciated and dedicated to the Buddhist teaching, who is meditating at the root of a tree, grant me that Indra as a wish. And the third one says, the Holy One, who, um, in whom all defilements have disappeared, whose passions, hatred and delusions are broken, grant me that Indra as a wish. So all of them are asking for Arahan not for any, any kind of worldly um, pleasure. And the fourth one also says, whose mind is like a rock, doesn't waver, who has realized um, release, grant me that Indra as a wish. And the fifth one says, for whom neither on earth, nor far away, nor in between there's anything, non-being and non-given, grant me that Indra as a wish. And the sixth one says, the one who is like a lotus leaf in water, like a mustard seed on the tip of a needle, not um, polluted by passions, grant me that Indra as a wish. 
So they're all asking for arahants, and the seventh officer says, a learned and eloquent disciple of the Buddha, freed from the burden of the leaves, grant me that Indra as a wish. So all of them are asking for arahants. Um, but obviously, uh, uh, this is not within Indra's power. He is a god of the sensual realm. So he says, I have no power over the holy ones. I am not a master of the holy ones. Wish for something else, girls, even if it be sun or moon. Uh, and the princesses obviously are not happy with this kind of answer. And they say, uh, not being a master, you wish to be a master. Without being able to grant wishes, you claim to be a granter of wishes. Um, by, uh, by granting a wish without being a master, now Indra, what are you going to do? Um, and now they start to criticize him and compare him to an old cow. And they say, who's able to cross a river without having reached one of the two banks at a place where there is no fort? You, Indra, are desperate, like an old cow stuck in a swamp. Um, so obviously Indra is not that happy and he tries to appease them and he says, um, girls, you are a lay followers of the Buddha and I'm also a lay follower. In the teaching, I am your brother. I grant you a wish. So he's still offering to grant a wish. He just can't grant the wish that the princesses actually have. And the princesses now say, we are not begging you, Indra, and we are also not sending you away. You yourself must know what the wishes of the princesses are about. So the princesses refuse to make any other wish and they kind of lose interest in him and they're not uh, begging him to grant the wish and they're also not sending him away. And they just say, well, you yourself must know uh, what this is about. And at this point, this story ends. And as I mentioned, this is the oldest version of the story. And obviously the ending here is a little bit unsatisfactory. We don't really know what happens now to the girls. Are they staying as ascetics? Are they going back to the palace? Um, what's going on? Do they become Buddhist nuns? Um, so as I mentioned, there's a Chinese version and a Tibetan version. Those versions are somewhat later. They have continued the story because obviously they also felt that the story was a little bit up in the air at this point, not really brought to a proper conclusion. So in the Tibetan version, um, at this point, the princesses give um, Indra a Dhamma talk. So now there's a proper Dhamma teaching to Indra so that he may understand. And then at, uh, after the Dhamma talk, Indra leaves. And in the Chinese version, at this point, um, there is a uh, another god, another spirit who appears and um, suggests that they go and see Kasapa Buddha. And uh, Kasapa Buddha is close by, so they all go. And then Kasapa Buddha says, well, it's no wonder that Indra cannot fulfill this wish because even Arahans and Pacheka Buddhas cannot fulfill such wishes. And then he gives them a, a Dhamma teaching, a discourse. And at the end of the discourse, he prophesies he prophesies that they will become Buddhas themselves in the future. So um, for this reason, uh, the Chinese version, for example, doesn't identify the princesses with any nuns or any women at uh, Gautama Buddha's time, because um, obviously the sequel is different. The future life is different and they will become Buddhas themselves. Um, so they don't become foremost nuns of, uh, under Gautama Buddha. So after Kasapa Buddha has prophesied their um, future Buddhahood, the, uh, a miracle happens and the princesses rejoice to such an extent that they fly up in the air and they all transform into men. Um, so obviously you can see this is again a later story where it is uh, considered much better to be a male than a female. Um, so at this point, uh, apparently the princesses have accumulated enough merit uh, to acquire a male body. 
Um, so this is the end of the story of the seven sisters. So obviously this is a story about uh, women being really dedicated to Buddhist practice, also to the difficult ascetic practices, to practicing death contemplations on a charnel ground. Uh, as we have seen, the story is not preserved in the Pali text, but it is preserved uh, in multiple editions in non-Pali text. Um, again, as I've already said, this is probably because ascetic practices and women uh, became a somewhat controversial mix in later tradition in the Pali. And non-Pali traditions seem to have been much more open to women undertaking these practices. Um, and at this point, I would like to finish for today. And if there are any questions or comments, then uh, we can try to answer them now. So does anyone have a question or a comment? Dana, yes? Yeah, I'm a bit puzzled about, you know, the, um, uh, the uh, Buddha Kasapa, you know, when did he, when was he supposed to exist on Earth? You know, these days we know there is evolution. And so it doesn't really make sense from that point of view. So if there is any truth in it, it would have been different planet a different planetary system. What do you think? Yeah, uh, obviously this is a lot of speculation and I also don't have a definite answer to that. Um, yeah, so, so I, I really can't answer your question. Some people think that probably he lived a few centuries before the Buddha. Yeah. So not that much, like not a very long time before the Buddha, but because at that time people, um, like oral literature wasn't that well developed. So his teaching would have been forgotten quite fast. So since the dispensation would have ended fairly quickly, there was another opportunity for an, a new Buddha to arise. Um, so that is one possibility, of course, um, which also explains why sort of the level of civilization that we see in the stories is fairly similar to Gautama Buddha. Um, so, uh, yeah, I really don't know. People say he was born on different planets. People say, um, that, um, modern history isn't correct and that previous Buddhas did actually exist in India in prehistoric times at the times of the dinosaurs and, and stuff like that. So yeah, it's a, it's a lot of speculation. I am not quite sure. Yeah, yeah I'm not sure either. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Do you know if there are other stories from that part of the world about seven women working together? Mm. I'm not quite sure. That's an interesting question. Um. Well, there are other stories about women working together, but the number seven, I'm not sure if there's any mention of the number seven. Mm. Yeah. So, for example, there are stories about uh, Mahapajapati and her 500 women doing stuff together in previous lives. Uh, but that's obviously quite different. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. Sorry. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, because yeah. I... The, the, in in um, Australian Aboriginal mythology, there's a very strong um, line of stories about seven sisters who are mm. running away from the man that's in love with them, and they end up um, rushing into the sky and forming the Pleiades as a constellation. Mm. Yeah, I'm not that familiar with Greek mythology, but isn't there also something in Greek mythology about this? The, the, those players be, being seven women in some way? Um, I forget, but it's highly likely because, I mean, that's how how the constellations got their name mainly, yeah. in, as far as we're concerned. In yeah. Greece. 
Let's look it up, thank you. Tracy, yes. Um, thank you for this. Uh, do people currently tell stories of the Seven Sisters in different Buddhist cultures? Um, like I am most familiar with the Theravada culture, obviously. And because in Theravada, the story isn't well preserved as we have seen. Uh, I haven't heard the story of the Seven Sisters being retold in any Buddhist uh, circles that I have been to, but uh, sort of the, it keeps on being mentioned that there is a story of Seven Sisters, but nobody actually tells the story. Um, so for me, actually, it was very interesting to prepare for this course because finally I get to look into all the non-Buddhist, uh, like the non-Pali sources. And uh, actually, I first studied this. Um, this, uh, this whole legendary, legendary like cycle uh, when I was preparing for this course uh, and when I started to look in all the Sanskrit, into all the Sanskrit and Chinese sources and so on. So um, I'm not familiar with anyone actually teaching these uh, stories in, in modern times. Um, people teach obviously all the commentarial stories and so on, but because the story isn't properly found in the Pali, Pali and commentaries, I haven't heard that particular story being taught much. Which also, I mean, it also shows that we don't even have an English translation of the story. So that shows us that the story really isn't popular. Yeah. We have a French translation of the story though. So if anybody can, can read French, uh, I can, can tell you where you can find the story. Okay. I see Gillian is nodding. Uh, yes. So, yes, um, I, was, I was nodding, thanks. Okay, yeah. uh, actually there, there is a book, the Lokutara Vada Vinya has been translated into French. So there is a book, let me see if I can find that book real quick. So here is the book, uh, and it's obviously a mirror image. So this is called Regle de Discipline de Non-Buddhist by somebody called Edith Nolo. And this was published in 1991. Uh, I can send you an email. So unfortunately, this is not available as a PDF as far as I know. So people have to buy the book if they want to see it. But if you could just hold it up to the camera again, I could take a screenshot. That would save you emailing. Oh, okay. But yeah, as I mentioned, I think it's mirror image. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. No, it's perfect. Oh, okay. It looks like mirror image on my screen. Okay. Yes. Done. Thanks. Um, okay. And this has the whole um, Bikuni Vinaya of this Lukudaravada school. And there are plenty of Apadanas in there, including the one about the seven sisters. So if there are no other questions, I received an email yesterday from Cindy and I see Cindy is here also. And she asked if we can do some chanting of Terigata verses because of obviously the Terigata originally was an oral literature supposed to be um, recited or chanted. Um, so I have actually uploaded uh, a chanting of the first chapter of the Terigata verses to my channel yesterday evening. So if you like, you can check that out. Unfortunately, the quality isn't very good and I'm also not a professional chanter, um, but I've uploaded the first chapter. And if I get around to it, I might uh, upload a few more chapters. Uh, we'll see. But um, yeah, Cindy was asking if we can do a chanting during this course. So next week we are talking about Yasodara and Yasodara does not have a Terikata verse. So uh, that won't be possible, but the week after we are doing Bata Kapilani and Bata Kapilani does have a verse in the Terigata, so maybe we can do that at the beginning. Um, so for the, we, we still have three more courses, uh, three more sessions in our course. So that will be Yasudara and then um, Bata Kapilani and then Tulananda as the last one. And uh, Bata Kapilani and Tulananda, obviously they have a very they have a story that is very much interlinked with each other. 
And both of them also have a very interesting connection with Mahakasapa. Um, so Mahakasapa, we know the guardian of the text who um, you know, presided over the first council and then who seemed to have introduced all these misogynistic tendencies into our text. So having nuns that have close relationships with him will be very, very interesting. So one of them has a, seems to have a good relationship with him. One of them seems to have a very bad relationship with him. And um, so we are going to explore that more. And I think those two sessions uh, should be really interesting. Uh, and of course, um, we can do that chanting then when we do Batakapilani. So if there are no more questions, then I think we can end for today. And as usual, we will end with uh, three sadhus. Please feel free to join me if you would like. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And I'll see you all next time.